And good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are tuning in around the world. We are so glad for you to join us tonight on Stories and Myths. And you might notice in the lower part of the screen uh, that the last names of both people are the same this week. And even though he looks a little bit like John C. Farrell, this is not John C. Farrell. This is my son, Aaron C. Von Buzik. And we want to welcome yep. Aaron to the program tonight. So glad that you could be with us. Thank you. Yeah, this is awesome. I'm really excited to be a part of this. This is uh, Well, this is I am excited to have you as well. And uh, for those who are tuning in, um, Aaron has just uh, made some history himself in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you're coming up on the two-week anniversary, am I right? Yep. Uh, me and uh, my wife, we tied the knot, literally. We did the knot tying ceremony in our wedding. and. Yeah, it's been it's been amazing. So it's uh, certainly a new season. So it's been really awesome. Well, that is exciting, and uh, we uh, uh, we did this uh, and very wisely. Uh, Aaron and his wife Julie are both uh, graduates of the Regent School of Communication, where they studied TV and film and video, and so this wedding was prepared. Uh, as you know, from through the eyes of filmmakers, and so because yeah. of that, uh, they wanted us there, uh, for golden hour at sunrise, and we were right on the shores of Lake Erie, and the sun rose behind us. Mm -hmm. As uh, well, I say behind us, I mean, um, because I co officiated the ceremony with Julie's father who's also an ordained minister. So what gave you guys the idea yeah. to uh, to do this cinematic type of wedding? Yeah, it certainly is cinematic. Um, yeah, we just, you know, we both, we're, you know, we've worked on plenty of film projects in the past and you know, there's just something about early morning light that is just incredible. And Lake Erie, uh, they have a saying that it's like the third most beautiful sunrise. <laughs> <laughs> you know they they don't set the standards too high, but it's but it's certainly amazing. And so we just knew that it would look gorgeous, and you know from a uh, you know from a, an emotional standpoint and our connection, we wanted to look at this as a new season, and so we wanted to start it at the beginning of the day. So we wanted it to symbolize as much of a new beginning for the two of us as possible, which you know was kind of always the idea. So there's an element like that there to it, but it was also simply because we knew that the photos and videos would look pristine. And <laughs> and so far, yeah, everything that we've seen from our amazing photographer, uh, Daryl Morgan, I'll give him a little plug, um, has been amazing. <laughs> um, so we're, we're really thrilled and really excited to see the rest of it. So uh, I am as well. As, as you said, the uh, photos that I've seen and the one little clip of video that I've seen have been amazing. And <laughs> yeah. I can't wait to see more. So that is very yeah. exciting. Yeah. So uh, um, one of, oh, I was going to say my aunt uh, that was there, she was saying that it was amazing because as soon as Julie got down the aisle, the clouds parted and the sun shone through. It was really kind of spectacular the way that it all came together. So Yeah, it, it really was. It was, uh, for me, uh, it was almost like a dream moment or a movie moment uh living yeah, it moment. felt <laughs> like it was we were in a movie yeah right i was waiting for someone to shout cut <laughs> <laughs> yeah well hopefully no one will ever do that so we'll just yeah, let no, the movie no, keep, keep playing yeah well, that's awesome <laughs> that's well uh we said earlier that you and julie uh attended the regent film school uh, tell us what the two of you are, are doing now in the film and video and television industry. Yes, so uh, currently uh, Julie is working um, as a producer uh, for CBN, um, specifically with the uh, show Gizmo Go and uh, the soup and also on the side uh, Superbook show uh, where she does a lot of editing, but also 
you know, a lot of producing. And so that's kind of been where she's been going, but she's also excellent uh, behind the camera, like as an operator. And so uh, we've been able to work together actually on a couple projects, which is really cool. You know, you know, a lot of people, you know, don't necessarily get the opportunity to go to work with their wife, you know, which is <laughs> really cool to be able to be on set and to collaborate because, you know, film is such an artistic medium, you know, and so there have been a couple opportunities that we've had where it was really great getting to work together um, and getting to see her shine in that way because, you know, I've only ever seen the product. I've never gotten to see, uh, up until recently, gotten to see her operate that way. Uh, as for me, I just got done working on um, a show up in Richmond uh, called Swagger. Uh, it's produced through Apple TV, and it looks like it's going to be amazing. I'm really excited to see it. Uh, the, you know, it's a show about um, basketball and, and youth programs and, and, and the struggles that, you know, young people go through trying to carve their way, you know, especially in something as huge as a sport, you know, na and, you know national sport like basketball. You know, the competition is so high, and so it makes for a lot of good drama. So uh, I'm excited to see that. I was a part of that on their lighting team. Um, started as a set lighting technician and then uh, moved to the rigging electric team. And uh, it was very rewarding being a part of such a large production. Uh, and now, <clears throat> now I just got to work on the pilot for a, uh, a TV series that they're trying to make for uh, history. It's called Hidden History. And the episode that we made for the pilot uh, was a about the train that was buried in Richmond uh, when they the tunnel collapsed and it you know buried like four or five um, people that are confirmed and then they think that there might have been you know up to a dozen or so you know workers that were buried as well and so it's this kind of almost Titanic like story but he, hid, you know hidden in, in Richmond's ground you know it's kind of incredible. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I had never heard this story before you worked on this project. Yeah, me either. It was really kind of incredible. But uh, when I was talking to the um, the producer and uh, the cinematographer, Ryan Pace, uh, we were, he was telling me the story about how they've been trying to make this show for like 10 years. And just now I've gotten uh, the green light to go make this episode. And then they're working on the second one, which will be happening soon. And so I'm, I'm waiting to hear about that, that one, too. So it's going to be cool. I love these stories of, you know, not well-known stories, you know, from our history, but they have really great lessons. I mean, lessons of hubris, you know, you can't be overstated, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. so. Well, that's what the Stories in Miss program is all about, uh, to tell those kind of stories that are amazing interesting, thought-provoking, informative. Sometimes they make you furious. Um, but then on the myth yeah. side, you know, uh, the program is meant to also debunk some of the myths that are out there as well, because uh, not all history is completely uh, what happened. Uh, so there are some things that we call history that we find out later as uh, further documentation is discovered we're not exactly what we thought that that it was. So uh, I'm so glad to have you on the program uh, tonight, Aaron. Yeah, no, I, it's it's awesome. I'm excited to hear more about these these things. I saw your uh, your post on uh, the Angel of Gettysburg, and I was immediately like, "Well, that sounds like a movie." <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> oh my gosh, what a title! It it really is. So just before we go into the questions, and do you have those questions ready? Sure. Yeah, yeah, I have some questions here that uh, okay. you know, got me thinking here. So. Before we go we'll into those questions, moment. we want to um, announce that um, Aaron and I are actually working on developing one of my books uh, into a video project the details of which will be announced uh, in further upcoming episodes once we get further down the road. Um, but uh, we are taking the things that I have been working on and combining with Aaron's uh, video skills and uh, both of our writing skills, because Aaron is also a talented writer. And uh, we are um, developing a very interesting project 
so we will announce more about that as time goes by. Yeah, I certainly think so. Already, I like my mind has bl been blown so many times. I'm like, how has this? How are we the first ones to be talking about this <laughs> coming into being a project? Like this is that type of thing where you know, in my mind, it's in the ranks of you know the stories that we hear of like you know George Washington crossing you know and like all that stuff, like all these huge historical stories that make American history so rich. And I'm very excited to bring more light to it. So yeah, me too. And it's also exciting to be working together as yeah. father and son, but in this capacity as partners. Yeah, no, it's it's amazing. It's funny, you know, um, <laughs> growing up in a, a you know in a home, you definitely didn't hide history from us. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So uh, I guess it was inevitable that we would eventually work together when you shared so much and you, you know, talked so much of, you know, the lessons that can be learned and, you know, and to value what we've gone through and to learn from our mistakes, but to also honor, you know, the good that has been done and, you know, the times that humanity's goodness has shown through, you know, especially in a world that can be so dark and, you know, unpleasant. So Absolutely. Well, one of yeah. those stories of light uh, is the angel of Gettysburg that you talked about earlier. So what, what's your question about the angel yeah. of Gettysburg? Well, number one, that monument, the photo of the monument is stunning. Oh, my goodness. It's the artistry behind that alone was enough to keep my interest much less you know I, I know that there's an incredible story behind it but i wanted to hear like you know what is that story and you know is there some you know other significance to the monument itself absolutely well elizabeth thorne is the woman that is now known as the angel of gettysburg she was the mother of three children and she and her husband had been hired uh, in 1855. They were immigrants from Germany. And so they were hired to be the caretakers of the new Evergreen Cemetery in Gettysburg. It was newly established and laid out, and they had just built uh, the uh, archway entrance. And if you've ever been to Gettysburg or you've ever seen the cemetery, you see that that archway entrance has on the two sides, uh, they were basically two apartments. So there was an apartment on uh, one side where Elizabeth and her husband lived with their three boys. And then on the other side of the archway was another apartment that was housed, uh, that housed Elizabeth's parents, her elderly parents. Now in 1862, uh, I'm sorry, 18, yeah, 1862, I believe it was, that her husband um, felt uh, that sh sh he needed to join the Union Army. And so he joined the army and he went off uh, to fight and was actually fighting, uh, ironically, was actually stationed in Virginia when General Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia invaded Pennsylvania and eventually invaded Gettysburg. Huh. And so she was, uh, Elizabeth was alone uh, caring for the cemetery. She and her father had an average of about five burials per month until the Battle of Gettysburg. And you can imagine uh, what happened because their home was literally on ground zero. Uh, it was huh. the central point for the Union Army, their home. That that uh, wow. was called Cemetery Hill. And uh, it was the high ground upon well, which... Imagine. What's that? Yeah, I was going to say, I can, I can imagine the high ground would have been, like, tactically, you know, advantageous for them <laughs> to, to hold. Yeah, and as I pointed out with uh, my co-host John last week, uh, General Reynolds had been uh, overseeing the Pennsylvania militia earlier in the war. And he was actually from Lancaster, which is not far from Gettysburg. And so he had studied all of the ground 
in and around Gettysburg. He knew it very well. And so when Lee started to approach, Reynolds had a very strong suspicion that Lee would want to consolidate his army in Gettysburg because Gettysburg is like the hub of a wheel with spokes going off in every direction. And all of those roads converged on Gettysburg, which is one of the main reasons why the battle was not fought in Harrisburg. It was not fought in Carlisle. It was not fought in Pipe Creek where General Meade wanted to fight. It was fought in Gettysburg because that was the place where Lee could say to all his different army corps, come together. Let's come together in this place. And, uh, and Reynolds had a suspicion that that's what would happen. And that's exactly what happened. And so Reynolds had been studying the ground and he met with one of the other corps commanders, General Otis Howard, the night before the first day of the battle. And they unrolled some maps and they looked at it and they agreed that they needed to hold Cemetery Hill, which is exactly where Elizabeth Thorne's house was. <laughs> And so um, right. she, they, um, when they moved into Gettysburg after General Buford, who was in charge of the cavalry, sent word back to General Reynolds saying, Lee and his corps, they're gathering here. Move in. We need your help. And so right. on July 1st, Reynolds and Howard moved in in the morning. And Howard stopped and left one of his divisions on top of little or on top of uh, Cemetery Hill. And he went up to the door and knocked on the door of Elizabeth Thorne and said, um, just to let you know, when I tell you to leave, don't ask questions, leave. But for now, go down into your basement and I'll tell you when it's time to go. And so wow. um, the first day of battle was a, an overwhelming Confederate victory. And so the Union Army got pushed all the way back to Cemetery Hill, and then there was a little bit of a saddle between, and then next to it was Culp's Hill. And that is where the Union Army was at the evening of the first battle. Well, they were sitting in the yard of Elizabeth Thorne. And so Elizabeth and her parents were down in the basement with the three boys. And early the next morning when the battle erupted, General Howard sent an assistant to go tell Elizabeth Thorne to get out of there. And so the, the family left and they moved uh, far south beyond a little round top uh, where several people in town had gathered waiting out the battle. Well, uh, the battle was absolutely hellacious on uh, both uh -huh. uh, Cemetery Hill and Culp's Hill. It was hellacious all the way down Cemetery Ridge and out into the peach field, the wheat field, uh, Devil's Den, and especially strong and, and difficult on Little Round Top, uh, which we talked about a little bit last week with uh, General Strong Vincent. And um, uh -huh. so the third day of battle, actually, uh, the tables turned. Uh, the second day was about a draw between the Union and the Confederates, a little bit of a Union victory in that they held their high ground. The third day was Pick, uh, Pickett's Charge, which was a total annihilation. The uh, Union wiped out yeah, sure. the Confederates, and that is why the Union won the Battle of Gettysburg. So it was first day, uh, a yeah. Confederate victory, second day, almost a draw with a little bit of a victory for the Union. Third day was a Union victory, and so the Union won the overall battle of Gettysburg and Lee had to withdraw on ironically the raining day of uh, July 4th under the cover of the rain and the clouds wow. uh, General Lee uh, and the army of yeah. Northern Virginia withdrew as the army of the Potomac wow. and General Meade were licking their wounds because there was tremendous you know, there were 50, more than 50,000 casualties. That doesn't mean 50,000 deaths. That means wounded, missing, or dead. Sure. Probably around 11 or 12,000 yeah. dead Man, that's, uh, between the two sides. Now, you yeah. think of 9-11, there were 3,000 dead on 9-11. At Gettysburg, there were 10,000 dead. You can't even imagine it. So yeah. Elizabeth Warren 
who, by the way, was six months pregnant. That's the other thing I forgot to mention. And she arrived uh, back, I think, on the 4th. Uh, and yeah. there were um, dead bodies everywhere, and there were dead yeah. horses everywhere. And there weren't just the dead bodies that were killed on Cemetery Hill, but people from town were bringing dead bodies in and stacking them uh, because they needed to be buried. They had been killed yeah. in town. And so um, the town tried to get people to volunteer uh, to help and even uh, offered to pay some people to help Elizabeth and her elderly father to bury sure. these. They ended up uh, burying, I think, 105 bodies. Now, remember, wow. this was the sweltering heat of July. And yeah. there were all those dead horses. And can you imagine the smell of all these dead oh people, gosh, all yeah. these dead horses? Um, yeah. Six months pregnant woman out there in the sweltering heat with her elderly father. And eventually the townspeople uh, got overwhelmed and they left. And then the father got overwhelmed. He was too tired. Overwhelmed by the smell. He, he left overwhelmed by the smell and the heat uh, and just wow. exhaustion. And so Elizabeth Thorne yeah. by herself dug 75 graves and buried 75 people oh my God. by herself. And so wow. um, sadly the she the you know the toll took uh, or the toil took a toll on the baby. And the baby was born mm. but was never healthy and died at a very young age, which is mm. very sad. Um, but yeah. Elizabeth finished the job, buried all the people that she needed to bury. And her husband continued in the yeah. war till the end of the war and uh, came home wow. and um, they ended up uh, continuing at the cemetery for a few years. And then they went on to, to other things. But the great irony is that Elizabeth and her husband are still buried uh, or were buried then in Evergreen Cemetery. And so their graves right. are there in the cemetery. And then about uh, uh, 12 years ago or so, um, a group got together to honor what Elizabeth Thorne did, and they created this statue mm. of her, which actually uh, was representing her, but it was also representing all of the women who served in the Civil War. And um, so it is the women's mm. memorial for the Civil War, but the person that is represented is Elizabeth Thorne the angel of Gettysburg. Right. Wow. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so this, I had, I had two questions while, uh, that kind of came to my mind. So you're saying that it was because of Pickett's charge that he just, they just lost too much men, too many men that when the rest of the battle kind of came about, they, the Confederacy was just too undermanned and that, and they weren't able to stand it. Yes. Um, why why was, overall they lost? It was as devastating uh, to the Confederate Army, the Pickett's Charge was, on uh, July 3rd, as the uh, assault on Marie's Heights in Fredericksburg was to the Union Army. If you remember, the Union Army got blown away uh, trying to move up the heights to uh, on, it was called Marie's Heights on the outskirts of Fredericksburg, and that was in um, late 1863 under General Burnside. And um, it was a complete disaster for the Union, who had to retreat back across the Rapidan um, and lick their wounds. And so yeah. the same thing happened at Pickett's Charge, only reversed. At Pickett's Charge the union was behind a stone fence, a much shorter stone fence, but there was a stone fence there. <coughs> and Lee sent his, uh, you know, Pickett's division along with a couple other divisions that were borrowed from the other uh, core of the army. Um, and so they attacked across a mile wide uh, sloping incline. And, uh, you know, it was a field day for the union artillery who just started sh sending shots out 
and they would send these shells out and they would blow up over the troops and they'd just drop like machine gun bullets onto this huge oh mass of okay. troops. Then as they got closer, they would use what were called grape shot or canister shot, which was basically these balls that looked like pinballs uh, from the old pinball games mm -hmm. in a can. That's why they called it yeah. canister. And they would shoot them out and it was like shooting a shotgun out of a cannon and it would just mow them right. down. Oh my God. Then when the uh, yeah. Confederates got close enough, the Union infantry stood up, took aim and blasted them with their guns, yeah. which were rifled uh, guns yeah. that were much more accurate than any guns yeah. up to that point in history. And so it was a, it was so devastating right. that uh, Lee uh, decided the next day that they were too wounded. Plus the other side of it was that they were running low on ammunition and they were so far from their supplies that mm. they didn't feel like they could, uh, you know, Lee didn't feel like he could do another uh, battle. And so they turned and escaped back over the Potomac yeah. into the safety of Virginia. And, You'll remember this because every time we would drive home to Erie, we'd go past Fredericksburg and I would I would pump my fist in the air and say, Fredericksburg, Fredericksburg, Fredericksburg. Well, that was <laughs> what the Union said at the end of Pickett's charge, as if to say, yeah. we got you back. Now you get what we got at Fredericksburg. Right. Wow. This is our revenge. Right. Oh, my gosh. Right. Well, the in the film business, you know, we have a little saying or a little like term called foreshadowing. And the, the Confederacy running, you know, on 4th of July, the irony is not lost on me. <laughs> you know, when you kind of like consider the, the meaning and, the, and, you know, the kind of picture that that paints, you know, on. on is it, well, the and the further, the further historical irony is that on the very same day, out in Vicksburg, Mississippi, the Confederates surrendered Vicksburg to Ulysses S. Grant. So the same wow. day that Lee was retreating after the defeat in Gettysburg, uh, they were also suffering a defeat in Vicksburg. And both things happened on the 4th of July, 1863. Right. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Man. That, that just gets my mind going with ideas of like tying these things together. It really is like incredibly providential looking at these things and how, you know, so much had to come into place together to a just stop the bloodshed before, you know, it could go on for years more than what it already did, but also just to maintain the union and to, you know, keep the, the country together, you know, like a lot yeah. of things and had to come together. And despite these two losses, the Confederacy went on for another year and a half. So, I mean, the war was far from over, even though these were two defeats for the Confederacy at that time. So they, um, wow. they continued to fight valiantly. Uh, but as Grant said, they fought for a cause that was one of the worst that people ever fought for. And I echo Grant's mm -hmm. sentiments in that. Yeah, you well. It's awful. Wow. Um, so actually, we had um, we had talked about the high bridge. This is a little bit of a topic change, but um, I wanted to hear some more about that because I was blown away by like how pivotal this sounded. Like in the in the little bit that we got to talk about, I'd love to hear more um, about this because it sounded like it was dramatic. Like you know, like <laughs> you know, you think of those. Uh, old Hollywood films of like the last stand and stuff like that. And like, it sounds like that kind of story. Yeah. Um, I had not heard this story before and I was doing some uh, reading probably about five years ago and I stumbled across this and I, I don't remember the source. I wish I did because I remember thinking, Oh my gosh, I've never heard this, but it, it really could have changed the course of the end of the Civil War. And what had happened is that after the fall of Petersburg and Richmond, Lee got a one-day jump on uh, fleeing to the West. 
Now, you need to remember that his army was really depleted. They were running low on food. Um, they had a lot of disease. And so it was a much weaker army than it had ever been, but they still were following their commander. And so they started moving west along the railroads coming out of Richmond and Petersburg with the goal of making it to Lynchburg um, and getting refitted, finding food and supplies. And then they were going to turn and go down south into North Carolina where they would join with General Joe Johnston and the remainder of the Army of the West. Well, if they did that, then they would have a, a strengthened army that could go against uh, General Sherman's Western Army or General Grant's Army of the Potomac and Army of the James. Um, it was a long shot, but with General Lee in command and with uh, very committed soldiers, it was within the realm of possibility. And so Grant... They, had, they could not go for it. Their, their pride. Right. Well, it was their <laughs> only hope. But there was a hope yeah. there. So Grant mm -hmm. knew that he needed to get around and surround them. And so what he did was he sent uh, under General Sher Sheridan, Phil Sheridan was the head of the cavalry. And Grant told him, stay to the south of the Army of Northern Virginia and don't let them turn south. We cannot allow them to link up with Joe Johnston. Then uh, Grant sent General Ord and his Army of the James, uh, which was infantry, and said, follow and stay as close to the cavalry as you can so that you also provide a block to keep Lee from turning south. And then he said to Meade, General Meade, who was the head of the Army of the Potomac, you follow on the tail of Lee and his army. Uh, and remember, they were a day behind, so they had to catch up. And so, um, you know, this was back when it was horses and, and trains when they could run a train, but normally it was horses and infantry yeah. on foot. So the, the most of these soldiers were wow. marching, but most of Lee's soldiers were marching wow. or on horseback as well. And so it was a race, a literal race, uh, to try to catch and then surround the Army of Northern Virginia. Well, they started to catch up. What happened is the second day after the Southerners uh, fled to the West, they were supposed to get food and uh, other supplies at a place called Amelia Courthouse. And when they got there, they were starving, and they were so excited to see these train cars that were supposed to be loaded with supplies. They opened up the train cars and there were guns and ammunition and cannon and all kinds of, you know, cannonballs and all that and artillery, shells and no food. And these people were starving. Oh my God. And so Lee had yeah. to say to them, go out into the fields and, and farmhouses and scour, scour and see uh, scavenge and see what you can find. And so basically that day that they had advanced of Grant, they lost because mm -hmm. they had to go find food. And they came back with like parched corn and yeah. not oh much else, God. you know, radishes right. and, you know, carrots maybe, uh, but nothing of substance because the countryside had been picked over because of the war. Yeah. And so they- But there hasn't even the been any wildlife? Uh, they might have found a little bit. But again, when you have an army trying to live off of the land for four years, um, yeah. that wildlife is either going to be killed or it's going to be scared off. And so there yeah. wasn't a lot. And so um, Lee gathered his forces back together and started marching again. Well, that allowed the Army of the Potomac to catch up. And they started getting towards the end and started taking shots at the tail end of the Army of Northern Virginia. Well, at this point, they're exhausted and now they're starving. And you know, if you ever watch the TV show Survivor, when people start to get to that point, they're not thinking right, they're sluggish, uh, they're kind of dazed and uh, they, you know, they get weak. And that was what was happening to the Army of Northern Virginia. 
At the same time, the Army of the Potomac, the Army of the James, the cavalry, they're eating like kings. They're eating steak. And, uh, you know, I mean, they're just having everything that they can ask for. So they're very strong yeah. while the Army of Northern Virginia is getting weaker and weaker. And so um, the real tragedy for the Confederacy happened at a place called Sailor's Creek, where one third of the army got cut off from the forward two thirds. And they, uh, the Army of the Potomac finally caught up and they went into battle and they were able to surround this one third of the army of the of Northern Virginia and they defeated them soundly. They took in five major generals as, as um, prisoners. They took in hundreds and hundreds of soldiers as prisoners and several uh, hundred were killed or wounded uh, in the battle. Well, Lee was up on a hillside uh, overseeing this and he turned to an, aid, an aide and he said, my God, has the army evaporated? Because he didn't know how many <laughs> soldiers oh were gosh. left, but he could see all these hundreds of soldiers surrendering right in front of his eyes. And he thought that the army was gone. Uh, but oh, he, he turned and started moving right. um, forward, and he found out that two-thirds of the army was still there, much smaller, but still enough of an army to fight. And now they were approaching a place where the Appomattox River took a turn at what a, a place called Farmville. Mm. And there were two bridges that went across mm. the Appomattox there. And um, one was called the High Bridge. And it was a Union trestle. And at the time, it was considered an engineering marvel. And the oh. Southern Railroad went across this, I think it was 150 feet in the air. And the amazing thing is, I've been there, and those original pilings, the you know, uh, the they were made out of stone. Those oh. are still there. Now, the bridge wow. is long gone, and they built sure. an iron bridge next to it. But those original stone pilings, that the original wooden bridge was on are still there, which is really wow. amazing to see this thing from back during the Civil War. Right. Then there was a second bridge that was very low, and it was called a cart bridge. And it was basically for carts and for foot traffic to go across. And it was, yeah. it was so low, you could reach over and fill your canteen with water uh, from the river below. Wow. And right. so right. Lee was meeting with Longstreet and they saw this and they said, this is an opportunity. If we could get across there and burn the bridges, then the army of the Potomac was going to go ha have to go way around. And that's going to give us time to get to, to Lynchburg and we'll, you know, we'll be able to get food and refit. And this could be what we've yep. been looking for. And so oh my gosh. Uh, that they, would have just made everything last. That, that could have given them distance to, go on for what months or maybe years. Wow. Maybe years. If they would have gathered with Joseph Johnston and they weren't tied down to cities, they could just go from one strategic place to another and fight yeah. on ground of their choosing. And whenever they did that, the, the uh, army of Northern Virginia quite often won those battles because they knew how to entrench. You got to remember that Lee was yeah. one of the top generals in the core of army engineers. Uh, you and I have many times mm. gone to Fort Monroe there in uh, mm -hmm. you know, Hampton, Virginia. That was built by Robert E. Lee. And you've, you and I have stood oh up on gosh. the side wow. of that fort. That thing is, it, it's, yeah. it's truly a fort. It is not something that you could get yeah. you know, through easily at all. It was amazingly built. So Lee knew how to build things, and he knew how to do entrenchments. And that is why at places like Cold Harbor and um, Petersburg, uh, the, the Army of the Potomac had a terrible time because they would go up against these entrenchments and just get mowed down because they were so well built. And even yeah. though they were firing into the entrenchments, the Southerners were were kept safe uh, because these uh, were so well built that the the shells 
and the bullets couldn't get through them. Whereas they would have these openings where they could see through and shoot the north or the uh, yeah the northern troops who had no defenses, and that's why Cold Harbor was another right. uh, Pickett's Charge or Fredericksburg because now it was the opposite and the Union got mowed down. Yeah. So at any rate, um, wow. so Lee sent uh, one of his um, uh, cavalry uh, groups along with a couple of uh, uh, corps or divisions of infantry to go and burn that bridge and uh, to make sure that the Union didn't get there first. Well, uh, Grant was also a brilliant strategist, and he saw the uh, problem that they were facing and the danger. He saw exactly what Lee and Longstreet saw. And so yeah. Grant had uh, General Ord of the Army of the James send out his cavalry and some of his infantry. And basically the Northern and Southern troops met <laughs> at the bridge. And it was a war or a battle to the death because the Union knew that they had to keep the bridge open the Confederates knew yeah. that they had to get across and burn the bridge before the rest of the Army of the Potomac got there. And so it was a really terrible, sad uh, battle. And so uh, General Ord uh, sent his second in command, his chief of staff, which was Brigadier General Thomas mm -hmm. Reed. And Reed took his troops there uh, to fight um against uh, the Southern troops under Brigadier General Thomas Rosser and Colonel Thomas Munford. And so, like I said, yeah. it was a race. They got there and they started to fight and um, Reed and uh, the other uh, general uh, or Colonel, I'm sorry, that was fighting on the side of the uh, Northern troops, they literally gave their lives. And um, they they were both killed, wow. and um, the um, the the second in command was a man named Washburn, and so Washburn uh, was oh. killed, and Reed was killed, and uh, at the same time, um, one of the Confederate generals who was over the cavalry was mortally wounded as he fired at General Reed, and there's a possibility that they shot and killed each other. Uh, they don't know that for sure. Um, wow. But um, Reed oh was gosh. shooting towards but... Deering and Deer or Deering and Deering right. was shooting towards Reed. We know that Deering killed Reed, but Deer, uh, Deering was also shot and eventually died. And Deering was the last Confederate general to die in the Civil War at the Battle of Highbridge. So the Confederates won the battle. Wow. And they took the entire Union mm -hmm. Brigade, all the cavalry that survived, all the infantry that survived, everyone either was killed or became a prisoner. And so the Lee took the Army of Northern Virginia across the, uh, the bridge, the footbridge, and they were thrilled when they got to Farmville on the other side because there was food in some train cars there. Oh my God. Well, right after they got there, the Union forces approached. Um, and so while they were distributing the food, the word got to General Lee that the Union troops were approaching the bridge. And so Lee said, stop eating. And they closed up the, um, oh. they closed up the train cars. Oh my and Lee sent them to the next wow. station, which was Appomattox Station. So the train wow. moved back to the west towards Appomattox Station. And so um, the, the Confederates turned and set fire to the bridge so that the Union could not get across. But because of the sacrifice of those Union forces, it gave time for the Union Army to catch up. And so while a couple of the spans of the high bridge collapsed, the lower bridge was a much harder wood and it was the Confederates were having a hard time setting the bridge on fire. And the Union Army oh. got there. They shot and scared them off. And the Union Army took blankets and canteens and they dipped them in the water 
And with the wet blankets, they put the fire out. And so they were able to keep the lower bridge oh from burning, which allowed the Union Army to cross and stay right on the tail of the Army of Northern yeah. Virginia. So there were two more days wow. or about a day and a half more of, of um, the Army of Northern Virginia running towards the west. And then um, cavalry, the cavalry of the United States got out in front of them at Appomattox Station. And a person that's very famous from history, General George Custer, was the one who captured the food oh. and the trains there in Appomattox. And they uncoupled the food from, oh. the, uh, from the train and then they destroyed the train so that the food could not go anywhere. And... Um, Right. And then uh, Sheridan came with his cavalry and came around the front of the Army of Northern Virginia. At the same time, General Ord and the Army of the James marched through the night. Uh, they were exhausted, but they knew that they were close to bagging their enemy. So they marched through the night. Yeah, and they had to close is, it out. Yeah, at first light, uh, General Lee said to General Gordon, uh, we have cavalry in front of us. We've got the Army of Potomac behind us. We've got the Appomattox River to the north of us. And there's, a, you know, the uh, we're having a, a hard time because there's an approaching army down to the south. See if you can break through the cavalry so that we can keep moving towards Lynchburg. And oh. so Gordon came up and started fighting the cavalry that was unhorsed at that point. And he was starting to push them back. Uh, because he had infantry, which is much stronger than cavalry. And they pushed him to the crest of this hill, and they felt like we might be having a breakthrough, you know, and they got hopeful. But right. then when they hit the crest of the hill, they looked over the side, and there were scores, hundreds and thousands of blue-coated Union Army troops from the Army of the James that were emerging from the woods and spreading out all across their front, and they were surrounded and there was yeah. no hope. And wow. so uh, General Gordon immediately, as soon as he saw that, his instincts told him, retreat, <laughs> because he knew if they kept fighting, they would be annihilated. And they went yeah. back to General Lee, and he said, we can do no more. And that was what led to the surrender that later that day there at Appomattox Courthouse in uh, uh, Wilmer McLean's house. And... Um, so the Battle of Highbridge was a critical battle that helped to lead to the surrender two days later at Appomattox. Wow. Wow. What a dramatic story. Oh, my gosh. The way, like, just, I mean, it really, it, you know, it's very easy to demonize the Confederacy and to be like, oh, you know, these you know, people that were fighting for slavery and da-da-da. But like when you look at just how devoted both sides are to fight that tooth and nail, man, there, there must be some like, you know, there must be like psychological studies out there of like how, what will cause someone to fight so hard, you know, that like in this in these moments that they'll, you know, burn their own, you know, their own bridges and they'll do everything like that they can, you know, and especially when they when someone's cornered like that. That's really I mean, it's so incredible to hear stories yeah. like this of people, you know, just holding on in, in such desperation. It's kind of well, amazing. and Grant I, said that in, in sorry, his memoirs. Uh, as he wrapped up his memoirs, he said, um, you know, I, I give full credit to these people for how valiantly they fought. And so there was always great respect mm -hmm. uh, there. And remember that in the beginning of the war, the original uh, army chief was Winfield Scott, who was the hero of the War of eighteen, uh, or I'm sorry, the War of uh, the Mexican War. And Winfield Scott said to Lincoln, "The very best soldier in the army is Robert E. Lee." And so Lincoln went to Robert E. Lee. Well, wow. he sent an emissary, uh, Blair, his his uh, Republican friend, uh, over to talk to Lee to offer Lee yeah. the to be the top general in the entire Union Army at the outbreak of the Civil War. And Lee thought about it, uh, but he came back and oh, wow. said, 
He turned it down and he said, uh, I cannot lift my sword against my native country because you got to remember that they saw the states as separate countries like oh, in Europe yeah. that came together in a union for the purpose of mutual defense against the um, empires of England, Spain, and France, and Russia, um, and also for mutual trade. But they saw themselves as basically separate countries. Wow. And so when, when Lee said, I cannot raise my sword against my native state or my native country, that was his mindset. And uh, yeah. there was a, an author, um, Shelby Foote, who was uh, featured prominently in the uh, Ken Burns Civil War series that you probably remember well. Mm -hmm. And um, Shelby Foote said it. that be <laughs> before the Civil War, it was said the United States are, and nobody was self-conscious about it at all. After the war, oh, it was oh. always said, and it is said today, the United States is. And he said, that's what wow. the Civil War did. It made us an is. Wow. Oh, my goodness. So, man, that is so interesting because for us now, it's the, it's the opposite where it's just totally ingrained, you know, that together we're unified, you know, and like there's a subsect, you know, that these that the states are smaller parts of the unified whole. And right. So, like, and that's what the Civil War answered. That was an unanswered question from the, the Constitutional Convention. And uh, the Civil War basically answered that, uh, that question of can states leave once they've come into the Union? And uh, the war basically yeah. said, nope, once you're in, you're in forever. Yeah. Because basically they signed wow. the document of the Constitution of the United States coming together as mm -hmm. a union. And they said that we are in pursuit of a more perfect union. We're ever in pursuit of a more perfect mm -hmm. union. And so Lincoln argued that once they signed that document, that was it. Whereas the Confederacy said, no, yeah. states' rights, we have every right. You know, we, we entered voluntarily into this confederation, this union, and we have every right to leave. Which the ironic thing is later in the war, there wow. were some Confederate states that were thinking about seceding from the Confederacy because they didn't like how it was being run by Jefferson Davis. So that is a snake that will come back to bite right. you. Right. Wow. Yeah. Well, we've got about yeah, eight minutes great. left. Yeah, uh, that is so compelling. We have about eight minutes left, and uh, you had one more question. Yeah, I did. I wanted to talk about... Um, you know, I see you've got the books behind you. Uh, yeah. yeah, and that artwork is stellar. I, I don't want to take up too much more time, but I, I have to comment on it. It really is incredible. Well, it gives, it. you know, um, I had seen my, this for years. My question, and it, go ahead. It, give, it gives the, uh, the image of forward motion, so it goes well with the title of forward. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, and... You know, one of the questions I wanted to ask was, you know, I, you talk about Lee being the, um, you know, what the top soldier and, you know, Grant was also brilliant. You know, we've talked about you and me personally but about his, you know, prowess as a general, as a strategist. Uh, and, you know, I like I've, I've had like a wondering of like, man, if the roles were reversed and you gave Lee the resources of the Union and grant the determination and the doggedness of the Southern, you know, Confederacy, you know, how would it have turned out then? That would have been very interesting. I, you know, that's a, maybe we'll just, I'll chew on that. <laughs> the question I. Well, you know, a lot of people have had that very question. What would have happened yeah. if Lee would have been in command? Uh, and, you know, interestingly enough, and I'm just going to take an aside on that because it's a thought provoking sure. question. In fact, why don't we, yeah. because we're running out of time, we'll come back to the question from this book next week. But um, okay. after Grant left the White House as president, he toured the world for two years. Mm -hmm. And he met at one point, you know, he met all, he had dinner with uh, Queen Victoria and they met the Pope in Rome and they went to Jerusalem and, you know, all these, you know, the Sultan of Turkey gave them 
or of the Ottoman Empire, but in Turkey, gave him two yeah. purebred Arabian horses that Grant shipped back <laughs> to the United States. And those horses started being studded out. And so some of our thoroughbred horses today are direct descendants from that gift from the Sultan. <laughs> oh my God. But one yeah, of the well, people- Well, Grant that, loved his horses, so. Oh, he, he absolutely did. And he built a beautiful, a beautiful horse stable for his horses out in St. Louis, which if you ever go out to Whitehaven, uh, which is now a national park, the Grant home in St. Louis, oh. Uh, they, they converted that horse stable into the museum and it is a beautiful, beautiful, wow. I mean, it's amazing because the building is the same building on the outside. It's just been, you know, renovated yeah. and painted and, and it shows how much sure. Grant loved his horses. Cause in some ways that barn was nicer than the house, <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> But oh going back God. to what you, but That's what you great. had said <laughs> earlier about um, Lee yeah. being in charge, when Grant met with the Chancellor of Germany, a man named Otto von Bismarck, Bismarck said, uh, "It was so sad that your country had to uh, fight this civil war," and Grant immediately responded and said, "But it had to happen." And Bismarck said, yeah, you had to restore the Union, hmm. just like Germany had to fight to preserve its uh, integrity. And Grant said, not only fight the Union, and this is so important, he said, but also destroy slavery. Hmm. And Bismarck wow. was a little bit taken back by that. And he yeah. said, well, what do you mean? And Grant said, slavery was a cancer on our country. And as soon as slavery uh, fired upon the nation, he said, I knew that it had to be destroyed. Yeah. Not just put down, not just contained, which is what Abraham Lincoln uh, ran on. People think that Lincoln was a, a fire-breathing abolitionist. He was not. Lincoln was a pragmatic mm. politician. He did not run in 1860 saying that he wanted to abolish slavery. He said he wanted to contain it. But just containing slavery to the slaveholders of the South, yeah. that was enough for them to go to war, to break free yeah. from the Union, because they felt like we don't want anything to cur curtail our desire for slavery. And if you study yeah. what their plans were, they wanted an empire of slavery that would stretch through Mexico into Central America and South America. Slave holding. Oh my gosh, it would have been a cartel. Imagine what would have happened in the 20th century if they would have won. It's hard oh to even God. imagine. You know, you're talking about what if yeah. Lee did this? Well, what if the Confederacy won and they achieved yeah. their goal of race-based slavery? These same roots and the same seeds of these ideas were adopted by Adolf Hitler. Yeah. It's the same right. thing. Wow. That's what people people need to be yeah. honest with themselves and recognize that, as Grant said, this was a cancer and it had to be done away with. Yeah. There are people who said, oh, it, slavery was dying and it was about to, to be uh, you know, done away with. According to the historians who've done in-depth research, including our friend uh, who wrote the book about Gettysburg, what's the last name? Geltz? Um, oh, uh, Gelzo, Gelzo, Gelzo. Yeah, Alan Gelzo. Alan Gelzo did yeah. in-depth research on this, and he is a professor at the University of Gettysburg. He's one of the world's leading authorities on the Civil War, and he said all of the research yeah. that he did showed that uh, in 1860, slavery was going strong with no signs of weakening at all. In fact, the throughout the Confederacy, oh, wow. they were starting to talk about how can we uh, start adopting industrialization like the North has and start putting slaves into factories. Out West, they talked about how yeah. can we put slaves wow. into mines in the mountains? They had no people who say that yeah. slavery was about to die. Wow. I, I just don't see the evidence for that. And so when you yeah. go back to what Grant was saying to Otto von Bismarck, Grant said that we had to destroy slavery. We could not build a peace. 
And Bismarck said, well, it's so sad that the war went on for so long and there were so many people killed. And Grant said, yes, but perhaps it was Providence. Yeah. He said right. that if the war would have ended earlier, slavery might have been left intact. And yeah. he said it would have risen up again and we would have had another war to fight. Yeah. Wow. But because the war stretched out as long as it did, uh, the views of the whole nation turned, uh, and they turned when Abraham Lincoln realized that he couldn't fight just uh, with the cause of preserving the Union. It was not enough, both mm -hmm. from a moral standpoint, from a uh, you know a vision casting standpoint, but also from the standpoint of in order to defeat the slave or slavery in order to defeat the Confederacy, the North had to uh, take slavery out as something that contributed to the Confederate war effort. See, that's the thing that yeah. people forget is that in the North, you had to have all kinds of people cooking and taking care of the horses and bringing in supplies and all these things. And up until yeah. the time when the Emancipation Proclamation was, was given, on uh, December 31st, when it went into effect, January 1st, 1863, all of that was done by white people. Whereas in the South, they had yeah. thousands of black slaves in the army doing all these things so that the white soldiers could fight. So if you come against wow. and free the slaves, for one, uh, Lincoln knew yeah. that the slaves would you know, try to get away to, to obtain their freedom. Mm -hmm. For another, it starts to uh, erode the strength of the South in that uh, mm -hmm. it starts to erode that slave free labor base. And that then, you know, did that. But it also gave a second cause. Now, there were still plenty of racist people mm -hmm. in the North, in the Army of the Potomac, who didn't want to mm -hmm. fight to free the slaves. But there were also many, many people in the North who said, wow, uh, it's not only taking care of the Union and keeping the Union preserved, but we're also going to fight to free the slaves. And so there was a song that was uh -huh. sung among the Northern troops called John Brown's Body. And this song was uh -huh. basically saying what John Brown started in freeing the slaves, because of the Emancipation Proclamation, uh -huh. we as the army of, of the you know, North, we are an army of liberation. Mm -hmm. And so they sang, John Brown's body is mm -hmm. a mortal in the grave. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Our, our charge, his soul is marching on. And basically they sang that song as a way to keep their, you know, their strength up and to give them another reason to fight. Yeah. But the other thing that happened is that the Emancipation Proclamation allowed Northern black soldiers or, you know, African Americans to join the army and to fight. And Abraham Lincoln said, we've been waiting on this. And, you know, uh, Frederick Douglass had put pushing and pushing Lincoln. You've got all these black people who are dying to fight because they know better than anybody else that this war is about freeing the slaves. Let them fight. Yeah. Yeah. And when they let them fight, they became a tremendous asset for yeah. the North and for the Northern troops. And so that's right. why Grant said, uh, he said to Bismarck, I think it was providential that it went as long as it did so that slavery could be done away with once and for all. And that yeah. may be why, wow. one of the reasons why uh, Lee was not uh, chosen, if you're going to be speaking providentially, which uh, yeah. Lincoln certainly spoke providentially in his yeah. second inaugural address. And he said that this war, uh, if, if it takes all of the blood shed by the lash uh, of mm. the slavers over 400 or 250 years to be equaled by blood shed by cannons and guns, then he quoted mm -hmm. Isaiah and he said, then it mm. must be said today, the way it was said 2,000 years ago, that the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Lincoln said, basically, 
that slavery or the war uh, was God's punishment for slavery and that uh, all that mm. bloodshed was there to revenge the blood that was shed by the slaves and all of the mm. toil that was uh, given for free had to be made up by the lives of those who gave their lives in the Civil War. It's a profound statement uh, from the president, and it was yeah. echoed by General Grant and President Grant. Wow. Right. Wow. Oh, my goodness. I mean, can't quite argue with it. <laughs> you know, like these people that, you know, the, you know, saying that it was for, you know, states' rights and stuff and things like that, like, you can't, can't – <laughs> You know, you can't argue when both presidents that were, you know, active in the Civil War, obviously Grant wasn't present during the Civil War, but both who had a hand in it speak so boldly and so directly well, about it. Um, there are still yeah. thousands who do argue against it, but I, I think that if you go into these questions open minded with an open mind and a fair uh, heart and not just from how you were raised uh, and actually look at these issues, yeah. Um, it's hard to argue against these things, I think. So, well, Aaron, we're past our time. Uh, any final yeah. thoughts uh, as we wrap up? So glad that you've been with us tonight. Yeah, no, this was uh, incredible. I love hearing these, the details, the amount of you know, knowledge that you've accrued gives such a bright, vivid image when it's retold in, and all of these different assets that are, are elements that come together to really paint a picture of just how important this is and like so timely. Like I'm blown away by it. And so like this is excellent. I am so excited to see more of uh, what comes out of this show and the different uh, new pieces of knowledge that can help in people as we like, you know, look, you know, history. A lot of people say history is a mirror, you know, and you look, you know, you look back to check within, you know, and to check your own heart and to remember what, where we've come from and the, the lessons that we can learn. And I think there are certainly, you know, it sounds like hundreds of lessons <laughs> from just how vast this is, but like so many things can be taken in and can be applied to our own lives, and our own, you know, uh, our own modern problems that we're looking at as a country to make sure that we are continually striving towards making a more perfect union. That's exactly right. Well, thank you for being with us, Aaron. It's been a pleasure. And uh, I yeah, just want to remind so people that if you are interested in uh, purchasing Forward, you can get it at grantforwardbook.com. And then the uh, biography, which is right there, is called Victor. And you can get that at grantvictorbook.com. You can get them at Amazon or wherever books are sold. Go to your local bookstore. And if they don't have them on the shelf, ask them to put them on the shelf. Uh, so that other people will know about them. Uh, if you have questions that you would like for us to answer here on Stories and Myths, go to my website, which is vonbuzik.com, just my name right there with no space, vonbuzik.com, V-O-N-B-U-S-E-C-K.com, and send your question. We'd be, we'd be happy to answer uh, these questions. I wanted to point out uh, Marlene Banks said that when she was a child, they jumped rope as they sang the song John Brown's Body, which I think is amazing. <laughs> Just absolutely amazing. Yeah. All those generations later, uh, but it still has the power because it really said uh, this is, you know, one of the things, not the only thing, but one of the important things that uh, the Civil War was fought over. So that's just wonderful. So once again, thank you for joining us for Stories and Myths. We're here every Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern U.S. time. And we hope you will join us again next week. So for Aaron Von Buzik, John C. Farrell, who couldn't be here tonight, I'm Craig Von Buzik. Have a wonderful evening, morning, or afternoon. Take care.